years ago, I tried to be a vegetarian. First couple of days, it went really great. I ate lots of salads, I felt fresh and healthy, and even I felt slimmer already. But the problem began on day four. I started to have a great craving for one of my favorite foods, which is a beef burger. But I knew that I shouldn't have this. I'm a researcher who studies self-control in food consumption. So it'd be really shameful if I give up so easily just after a couple of days. So I went to a vegetarian restaurant for lunch to prevent me from eating any kinds of meat. And of course I chose a veggie burger because that was the most similar option um, to what I craved. And it was a pretty decent veggie burger, I would say. Um, and I finished all. But can you guess what happened that night? <laughs> Stomach ache? <laughs> no, actually that was the last day of being a vegetarian ever in my life. <laughs> <laughs> I went absolutely crazy for the beef burger. I mean the real burger. So I went to a burger restaurant and I ordered a giant big burger and I finished it by myself. My choice of a veggie burger, the problem that made me quit so quickly? I think so. And today I'm going to talk about why choosing a similar alternative is not a good idea when we cannot get what we want. So every day we make thousands of choices. We chose what to eat for breakfast, we chose what to wear for today, and we chose to come and listen to TEDx talks, which is a very nice choice, instead of doing something else. It would be really ideal if we can get our number one choice, but we cannot always get what we want. So according to a recent report by TNS Research Group, about 42% of shopping occasions, consumers cannot get their most preferred brand. Sometimes it is out of stock, sometimes it is too expensive, and in these cases, we have to settle for the second best alternatives, which we call substitutes. So substitutes are products that can be used to replace one another by satisfying the same consumption goal. So if a desired product is not available or unaffordable, consumers often look for and switch to its substitute. And there are different types of substitutes. Uh, anyone recognize this car? This is Lamborghini. So suppose you have a great desire to buy this fancy Lamborghini sports car, but it's too expensive and you can't afford it. What would you do? You have to find other options, right? So you may consider a similar sports car, but more affordable one. So this similar substitute has similar product features as Lamborghini. So he ha it has two doors and it has two seats and it is a low built sports car. But you can actually choose something different such as SUVs. So SUV is not a sports car, but it satisfies our general goal of having a private car. So it's, it serves as a dissimilar substitute. Another example, suppose you have been dreaming about having a vacation in uh, Maldives. Actually, this is one of my dream vacation uh, options. But if, if it is too expensive, then we have to find other options. So you may consider a similar beach vacation or you can consider something different such as going for skiing instead of uh, relaxing at the beach. So you see there are similar substitutes and dissimilar substitutes. Which one would be a better choice? Which one would satisfy our craving better? So in a study that I conducted with Joachim Buskerau and Kerry Morich, we tested how consumers choose a substitute when a desired product is not available and how effective their choice of substitutes are. And we tested this question in the domain of food,
consumption. So um, in one study, we studied uh, what kind of substitutes people generally prefer. So we invited participants to come to the lab, and first, we gave one tiny little piece of delicious chocolate. So that was Reader Sports brand, it's pretty delicious, and we pre-tested to make sure that this is delicious and desirable <laughs> chocolate to our participants. And when you eat only a small portion of food, how do you feel? You want to eat more, right? And this is a very well-known effect called sensitization or wetting effect. So we intentionally gave one tiny piece of uh, this uh, reader chocolate to increase our participants' desire to eat more of the reader chocolate. And after they ate one piece, they indicated how much they wanted to eat more of this chocolate. And after that, we told participants, sorry, but this chocolate is not available, but you can choose one of two options. So the first option was a store chocolate. So it's like a Parken Shop chocolate brand in Hong Kong. So it was a similar substitute. And the other option was granola bar. So granola bar is not chocolate, but it satisfies our uh, consumption goal of having a snack, right? So it serves as a dissimilar substitute. And participants indicated their choice, and they actually consumed their choice of alternatives. We found that majority of participants, about 73% of participants, they chose similar substitute, whereas only 27% of participants, they chose the dissimilar substitute. And a further analysis showed that the more they craved reader chocolate after they ate one piece, the more they were likely to choose the similar substitute. So in one study, we tested with different sets of foods. So we tested with uh, ice cream, donuts, fried chicken, uh, but all the time we found the same thing. People believe consuming a similar substitute will satisfy our desire better than consuming a dissimilar substitute. So we uh, tested whether this intuition is correct in other study. So in this study, participants came to the lab and we gave one tiny piece of reader chocolate and after that, participants were randomly assigned to and received one of three different foods. So one group of participants, they received the readers, uh, the same delicious chocolate again. And the second group, they uh, received the store brand chocolate again, which was a similar substitute. And the last group, they received the granola bar, which was a dissimilar substitute, and they consumed. And each participant, they received a pretty fair amount of food that they were assigned to as a snack, and they finished off. And after that, unexpectedly, they received a reader chocolate again. So a lot of chocolates going on in this study. <laughs> <laughs> but this time, um, they ate as much as they wanted, and we measure how much they consumed surreptitiously. So if our intuition is correct in that consuming a similar substitute satisfies our craving better, then those participants who had consumed the store brand chocolate, they should subsequently consume less reader chocolate when they received it again because they should be more satisfied by consuming the substitute as compared to participants who consume the granola bar, right? But this is not what we found. We found actually the opposite. So actually participants who had consumed the similar substitute, they subsequently consumed more reader chocolate when they received it again, as compared to participants who had consumed the dissimilar substitute or who had consumed the reader chocolate all the time. So the result actually suggests that those who had consumed the dissimilar substitute they showed less residual craving for reader's chocolate after they consumed the substitute uh, than those who consumed a similar substitute, right? Then why? Unlike our intuition, why consuming a dissimilar substitute satisfies our craving better than consuming a similar substitute? Well, um, in our research, we found that this is because of the mental comparison between the substitute 
and the desired option that was not available. So substitutes are usually less preferred than the products that they are intended to replace because they were not the number one choices in most cases. So if a substitute is similar to the desired option, then we are more likely to compare these two because it's easy to compare. And we are more likely to notice that this is worse than what I wanted to have. But in contrast, consuming a dissimilar substitute does not induce such a negative contrast because we don't really compare different things so easily. And this substitute looks very different from the desired option that I create. So back to my experience as a vegetarian, um, I chose a veggie burger because that was the most similar option to what I create. But ironically, this similarity actually made my experience worse because I was comparing the taste of veggie burger to the real burger that I create. And I realized that uh, this is worse than what I wanted. I want a real burger, right? So I believe if I had chosen something different, such as um, mushroom pasta, then uh, I might have been able to extend my days as a vegetarian a little longer, maybe at least a couple of days. <laughs> <laughs> so in concluding, life often presents us with situations where we cannot get exactly what we want. We may not get our dream job, we may not be able to afford our dream vacations, in many cases, we have monetary constraints or dietary restrictions that prevent us from eating the food that we really crave. Our intuition suggests that the second best option is a similar one to the most desired option. But our research suggests that second best option is actually a dissimilar alternative which satisfies the same general goal. So if we choose these similar um, alternatives, then we will be less likely to compare what we have and what we wanted to have, and we will be more likely to be satisfied with our choice of second best option. Thank you. Thank you.